Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to the Beyond, Beyond the Noise diversity panel. Uh, I'll be a moderator today. My name is Brian Dixon, and we've got an excellent uh, panelist uh, group today. Um, before jumping in, I'd love to just set the context. As we all know, tech has a big diversity challenge. And when you look at most large tech companies, the diversity numbers are anywhere between 2 and 4%. And there are a lot of barriers that kind of get in the way. And the goal today is really to, one, identify those barriers, and two, um, develop strategies to get past those barriers. Um, and just want to pass the mic down to everybody on the panel. And really, the goal, like I said today, is to walk away, walk out of this room with some key tips that you can do tomorrow. I'll start off with a quick introduction. I'm a principal at Caper Capital. We're a seed stage investment firm in Oakland, and we've invested in over 100 companies. Um, some of the notable companies are uh, Uber, um, Drop, Dropcam, and uh, we're proud supporters of Twilio as well. Um, and really excited about diversity, um, and we watch it and talk about this every single day from the investment side, and we'd love to just jump into the panelists to introduce themselves before we get started. Uh, great, thank you for that. Um, my name is Dom. I'm a software engineer at Twilio, and I also am the co-chair of diversity and inclusion there. Hi guys, I'm Daniel Navarro, and I run partnerships marketing for a team called Google for Entrepreneurs. Hi, I'm Carla Monteroso, and I'm the VP of program for Code 2040. Can we hear me? Hi, I'm Alia Rahman, uh, former program director at Code for Progress, um, where we trained community organizers of color to be um, developers. Um, my background is uh, as being a professional in the social justice movement. I'm also a Django developer. Perfect, excellent. So let's just jump right in. First question, why is diversity important? Dom, do you mind starting? Sure, uh, no problem. I think diversity is incredibly important. Uh, one of the big things is to know that not only, I know everybody says diversity of thought, but when you look at your, uh, your user base and you look at the people that work there, the best way to understand the problems of every one of your users is to have people uh, from those identities be a part of your user base and be a part of uh, your teams. And that way, not only are you uh, better in innovation, but you're actually addressing and making people feel comfortable. The other part of that is the young people being able to see a part of yourself or a part of your identity um, in roles that you aspire to be in is incredibly important. And I remember growing up and not seeing very many women of color or queer women that were out uh, in, in business roles or in technical roles. And the moment that I, I did start seeing these people um, be very public about who they were and their identities, it was incredibly life-changing for me and a bunch of other people. And I think that's incredibly important. I guess to your point there, I, uh, I didn't know that you could even work at a company like Google or Facebook. You know, I sort of used Facebook or Google and just constantly consumed it. But I was never aware that there is like tens of thousands of jobs behind this uh, until I actually met someone that worked at Google. I had to kind of pinch them like, oh, you're a real human, like this exists. Uh, so, you know, it, um, there's a, sort of the awareness side of why it's very important to, to go to these communities and say, hey, this is a job and this is a career path. There's a lot of innovation and potential that's not being tapped by, do, by not doing so. Um, there's also a big business case behind it. I think, uh, you know, you see there was, a, there was an interesting YouTube case study that was released last year. And something uh, when the iOS app released for, uh, for YouTube, they found that 10% of all, all video uploads were being uploaded upside down. And uh, they weren't really sure why, and they would later find out this was a total design flaw, uh, because they hadn't accounted for left-handed users. All of the designers and developers on the, the YouTube iOS app were right-handed. So they didn't even think that uploading with your left hand was even a thing that people would do. So when we think about diversity, of course, like, you know, specifically we're talking about gender, ethnicity, but it, it kind of goes beyond all shapes, sizes, and colors. And then there is a lot of business case as to why having a well-rounded, diverse team is an important thing. Uh, you know, Code 2040 gets its name from the fact that by the year 2040, there are going to be more blacks and Latinos in the country than there are anything else, um, which means that if we don't start actually 
getting proportional representation of engineers from the black and Latino community, then by the time we hit 2040, you are going to, and I would argue even today, you're recruiting from a smaller and smaller and smaller pool of people. Um, and that over time is going to create a situation where we are paying $400,000 for an entry level employee with absolutely no, uh, no experience on the job. Um, and so we have this, this ramp right now where we can do some change and, and actually make it so that there's proportional representation. And absolutely, I mean, I think McKinsey just had a study that said companies that have um, ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to outperform their competitors. Um, from a gender diversity standpoint, it's 15% more likely to outperform their competitors, um, in particular when they have ethnic and gender diversity at senior levels. Um, but, you know, we're watching this huge shift and change in the population demographic of the country, and if we don't have the kind of workforce um, that we need at that point in time, we're going to be priced out of innovation, full stop. Um, so, uh, I think that there is a concrete reason um, that affects the people in your company. Um, one that I want to talk about uh, that affects the people who want to be in your company. And uh, one that affects the people who don't know your company exists. Um, so, I live in Washington, D.C., which is a place, um, and I work with activists uh, and local organizing people around the country. So, um, that is a situation where you see a lot of granular level how people do stuff and then huge national statistics. Um, so, I would say that one of the most important reasons to have a conversation on tech diversity um, is that it is one of many ways that we chip away at the other big D word, which is what's actually happening, um, which is an attempt at desegregation. So, we no longer have um, judicial segregation in this country, but De facto wise, we do, okay? So there is no set of data that you can find that will not tell you that we do not have a huge pay gap, um, a huge hiring gap, and a huge gap in um, leadership positions between men and women and between white folks and people of color. Um, I think that tech has a role to play in teaching this country how to live up to the image it has created of itself as a fair and just democracy. Um, and that is a very real thing and what's happening in the streets um, right now around a lot of the unrest in many of our cities is not disconnected from what we are dealing with um, in our tech companies. So uh, that affects the people who already work there because I promise you that when the cities are going up in flames over racial injustice stuff, um, your uh, employees of color are distracted that day if you aren't saying something about that. Um, I will also say that every time I have to deal with a microaggression, meaning a little subtle like sexist thing that someone says or racist thing, um, I probably lose like an hour of productivity over the course of that week, if not maybe the day. Y'all are wasting money, right? If we don't handle um, the way that people treat each other at work. Um, so that is one of them. The second thing is that um, this morning I did calls with two different activist groups who did not know that Twilio existed and that they could send text messages to their 120,000 so members. Um, so that's a whole client base that didn't know they could use your product. Um, the only way we'll know about that is by participating in the kind of work that those folks do, um, going to their events and really engaging with those folks. Um, and uh, finally, um, uh, everyone has already mentioned what you are able to actually make um, is affected by uh, folks who are aware of the different problems. Um, I'm not sure who says it, but we have a quote out there now about how the tech industry has become very good at solving the problems of middle-class white men, like getting a date, getting stuff delivered to you, et cetera. Um, whole categories of products um, that you could uh, create and that, that could have tech um, as part of them. So, great. Per perfect, thanks. I, and I think at, the, at where we're at right now, um, from all the coverage about diversity in tech, um, when you have the conversation, everyone will agree. It's important. Um, and the whole point of this panel is kind of getting into, you know, what are you doing at your workplace and, and really about the, the, the takeaways. And I know Carla, um, Code 2040 is working with um, so many partners in tech. We'd love to start with you on what is Code 2040 doing and, and what are you doing in your workplace um, to address this issue because I, I think everybody's at the point in, in this room of, yeah, it's important. Yeah, yeah we have um, three different programs, well, uh, three and a half different programs at Code 2040. Um, one, the what people are most familiar with is our fellows program where we take interns from all over the country, put them at tech companies uh, all over the Bay Area and then do a weekly workshop and speaker series with them that helps network them to people in uh, the Bay Area, but also is everything from the very technical, how to do mobile programming, 
tech, effective technical writing to the psychosocial of I'm the only person of color and in my workplace sometimes that gets weird. <laughs> How do I manage that? Um, as well as communication and feedback skills because um, professionals of color notoriously get less feedback than their white counterparts and we want to really teach our students to be voracious about that um, so that they can continue to grow and thrive and reach middle management, senior management, um, which gives us this incredible vantage point of working with 30 different companies that are actively trying to get entry-level employees through the door and has enabled us to really do some pattern spotting on at the startup phase, at the 70 to 400 phase, at the corporate phase, what are the different parts of the funnel and what is keeping diversity and inclusion from actually taking hold, right? And so I think, you know, just a ton around that. We we have one of our programs, actually, The another program was birthed from that of, you know, 40% of our students were totally technically able, but had difficulty when it came to landing the interview, the resume, the, co the cover letter, the technical, uh, the technical interview, the behavioral interview, how to uh, really craft their brand. If you look at the net worth of, uh, the median net worth of white families in the country is $111,000. For Latinos, it's $7,500. For African Americans, it is $5,000. Um, and so that gap in, in net worth means that even if you are a middle to high middle income person of color, your network and resources when you are in that middle of the line is a completely different set of network and resources. And so Co2040 kind of comes in like that aunt or uncle that's going to hook you up with a job and information, right? And, um, and so we are doing that kind of that prep for the first barrier to entry um, with 5,000 students over the course of the next two years. Um, and, and really and all over the country, both here in the Bay Area and in our EIR cities that we are working with um, Google for Entrepreneurs actually in Durham, Chicago, and Austin. Excellent. And I would open that same question up to the rest of the panelists as well. I can't see if you're, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm actually really excited to talk about what Twilio does um, because it's a lot of the work that we do. and. Um, we actually do work with Code 2040. We've had workshops with Code 2040 with Hackbride students. We're starting one with Maven, which is a queer coding boot camp for uh, teenagers over summer and fall breaks. Um, we also work a lot with inclusion, and it's something that we've become very conscious about. Uh, when the co-chair and I had started really looking into diversity and inclusion, we divided up the work into what can we do internally and what can we do externally. And internally, she's done an amazing job at uh, hosting different workshops, like how to be a better male ally, how to identify unconscious bias training. Um, she's done great things like making sure that our job uh, descriptions have been as to make sure we remove the bias language from job descriptions. So we're not looking for coding ninjas. We're not looking for a cowboy. We're looking for great people and great doers that can that want to work and grow with a company. And uh, what I've been doing is going out and trying to get more people aware of Twilio and places that we're not just going to the same 12 universities. We're also going to other places where maybe, you know, um, somebody who's an amazing programmer couldn't afford to go to uh, Ivy League school or couldn't leave their family back in Montana to attend a different school. And it's things like that where we go out and we talk. I did a, a, a tour of the Bay Area schools and just telling them about what Twilio can do for them and what how they can be a part of this community. And it's really empowering to see people who other places have looked over and have not said anything about because of what college they went to or um, what skill set they may not have said. Because a lot of the times, you know, some, whether it's people of color or women or a different uh, underrepresented minority may not call out every single language that they know on their resume or may not um, feel that seven years experience is enough to even apply for a, a mid-level position. And then it's also understanding that, um, that unconscious bias in minorities are not necessarily always a visible thing. And that's something that a lot of places aren't as conscious about. Um, for example, being queer is not something that you can just look at somebody and say, you are gay or you are not gay. It's something that somebody has to consciously accept to themselves and being very aware of that and being aware of the language around that um, 
all the way from the job description to the hiring process to the interviewing process um, to the team dynamics is incredibly important. The uh, making sure that people feel comfortable in the place that they work and they feel as accepted as possible and understanding that uh, things like how to be a better male ally and understanding, hey, these microaggressions aren't um, acceptable in this place and making sure that everybody around understands this is important to the company. This isn't important to two people who started this. This isn't important to uh, just the executive team or the recruiting team. This is important to every single person in this company. And it's something that we all uphold. Uh, and I think that that's probably one of my favorite parts about working with diversity and inclusion. Sure. Uh, you know, when I joined Google in 2010. And uh, when I joined, I was a little intimidated. Uh, I went to kind of a second tier state school. Um, you know, being a Latino guy, there were certainly not too many of us in, uh, five years ago, and I felt a little isolated. And I think that you know, once I was there, I started to find you know a Latino here, a Mexican American guy here, someone you know from uh, from Venezuela, and, and every once in a while, I'd find these people. And, uh, and about a year later, we had created a little a little group, what will later be you know, now 150, 200 person employee resource group we call OLA. And uh, for us, it's kind of both internal and external facing. So as you guys are thinking about your employee resource group, some of the things that we do is uh, when we work with the community, we're out and we kind of have it divided up by a couple pillars, by entrepreneurship, by health, family, and education. So we're going to these various parts of the community getting young kids interested in technology and, and doing it in other languages sometime. You know, when we're speaking Spanish to parents about the importance of coding and getting your, your young daughters into these classes, that's going to resonate. Uh, then when we're, when we're working internally, we might be giving advice into the Google Wallet team as to the market behind the, the US Hispanic buyer. You know, when they're making transactions online, how do they do it? What websites do they visit? Things like that. So there's kind of this both external and internal facing uh, strategy we built um, kind of very much from the ground up. You know, we, we didn't exist until a few of us just kind of got uncomfortable and put it together. So there's this like ERG side that we built. But then also for my team and Google for Entrepreneurs, uh, Carla alluded to uh, a program we're called the Residency. So the Residency is this brand new program we just launched about a month and a half ago. And what we do is we started this off in Austin, Durham, and Chicago. And um, we went out and we were looking for high potential African American Latino founders. And we said, okay, we'll, we'll provide you with seed capital, no equity, no, no equity taken from our side. We'll give you Google mentoring, uh, co-working space at each of these local cities um, and a couple trips to Silicon Valley. In turn, you're going to be building your startup at this, these respective uh, tech hubs and you'll also be the sort of chief diversity officer of this space. So a responsibility you could have is maybe going out to the local African-American population, the community, and showing the youth, hey, come to my tech hub, come to my co-working space, I'm throwing this event for you and I'm inviting you personally. Uh, this is sort of a, a unique approach uh, at going the from the, gr the ground up and going through the route of, of the entrepreneur and the founder. We want to make sure that this is authentic as an experience possible for these, these communities that when we're inviting them we're saying, hey, check this out. Like, I'm building this. Like, I'm putting this together right now. See what I'm doing and check out this community that I'm personally inviting you to. Uh, something else that we've thought of last year, we ran this program called 40 Forward. So we have about 100 or so different countries that we operate in uh, through about 50 different partnerships, like co-working spaces, accelerators, groups like that. And one thing we did is we challenged 40 startup communities. These are organizations that are helping entrepreneurs. 40 startup communities around the globe to increase the female participation in their communities by 20%. So this could be a 20% increase in your event series you might run, 20% increase into the women that are in your co-working spaces, 20% uh, increase into the women that are joining your accelerator cohorts, so on and so forth. 
And we said, pitch us with a compelling case uh, as to how you're going to do it. And if we like the idea, we'll fund it. So we funded 40 different projects around the globe. And it was astounding what we saw work. And what we realized is that everything and the kind of most successful things, there was no one answer to this. Uh, supporting diversity looked very, very different if you were in San Francisco than if you were in somewhere like Gaza. In Gaza, actually, we noticed their pitch was that for in order to get the family buy-in for females to pursue entrepreneurship, the, they actually pitched us on providing small, small stipends, basically, to uh, make up for the opportunity cost lost of this female not providing for being the head of their house for that period of time. So we did it, and sure enough, these, these, these event series and, and the accelerator cohorts increased by 20%. Um, very, very interesting work, and uh, those are, I guess, a couple of things uh, that we've done for it. I'm just going to, do you mind if I just jump in? And you get, the next question is for you. I want to make sure we get to the takeaways, because um, that's really what um, getting beyond the noise means. So feel free to take it, and we'll just go right down the line. Cool. Uh, takeaways. Okay. So, um, so when I was at Code for Progress, there were two things that were really important to us, or to me as a program designer who had come out of engineering. Um, one was that uh, the assumption that um, we had the assumption that most developers of color probably wanted to spend most of their time at work developing. Um, and similarly, they were coming to a coder training program, so they probably wanted to focus on coding um, rather than spending a lot of time dealing with race issues all the time. Um, and we, one thing that we find is that a lot of developers of color in um, organizations are like being asked to basically do free work to fix that stuff at their, their organizations when they really are nerdy and want to make software. Um, so that was one important thing. And the other was the principle that when something is whack, you should find an expert, probably, that will help you. And so contrary to popular belief, um, being brown is actually not always the most expertise you can have in dealing with race stuff. So that stuff actually guided um, the way that we brought people into the organization, um, which in turn uh, affects retention. Okay, So sometimes those are talked about as different things, but I think the conditions in which you arrive somewhere have a lot to do with whether or not you stay. So for me, the takeaways are those things, and they actually weren't at all related to what we set out to do at that organization. So one, um, around interviewing. Um, so hiring for, di for diversity is actually not just about hiring um, more brown and black people. It's actually about hiring um, more racially conscious white folks too, and more gender conscious men, and more trans conscious queer folks, and all of this stuff. And believe it or not, you know how let y'all do um, whiteboard tests for your coding skill? You can actually ask stuff and test it and make sure it's working around other things that you value, right? So if we care about diversity, like we should measure it, test it, and not allow people to join our organization if they're flunking at it, right? And they should leave when they're not good at it also. So um, a lot of times people are afraid to, to kind of say like, we want to hire black people because it's a discriminatory thing. But you can ask every person questions like, um, after they finish their coding test or whatever, or maybe they're not coders, but ask someone, um, what are three things that you think a workplace can do to be really good to women? Right? It can be very, very gender conscious, which are different questions. Um, or tell us about a time that you have worked on a project with communities of color. Or tell us about a time you have worked on a project that was about racial justice. That is not about your DNA. That is about your skill set. Right? And we also didn't want like apologist folks of color who did not have any interest in like working on power dynamic stuff either in our program. Right? So we had a 2% selection rate because we were looking for those things as well as just like, well, I like to build stuff. Right? So that's really serious. You can ask those questions and you should. And if someone is not able to answer them, they should not have that job. End of story, right? Lawsuits are very expensive. They're <laughs> in money, and they are taking away productivity from your employees, right? So you don't want a bad culture where people can't just sit down and actually code. So that's one really important thing um, that we're doing. The other is where we were recruiting people from. So on that note of um, expertise, um, it's really cool to work at the intersections of the social justice movement and tech because it allows you to help um, community organizers upgrade their tech, and it allows you to help techies become more socially just by connecting experts. So the folks who have moved this country forward around um, gender and racial equality like did that. It was like They were like professionals at that. Um, we still have those people around. The civil rights movement is not over, and either is the feminist movement, or Stonewall, or any of that stuff. 
Um, so we recruited activists and community organizers because they had many years of experience having conversations about power um, and about race and gender. And they were practiced at that. They knew how to organize folks. And um, we have a mantra in community organizing that says, the truth alone will not set you free. Either would good, will good intentions, right? You actually need good programming, organizing strategy, and things to move the culture in an organization and change where you get folks. The other thing is, those folks know hella professional people of color and women who don't know anyone in tech. So social network research shows us that right, a lot of people are actually not connected. Um, so we, we went around the same strategy you would if you wanted to do a thousand person rally at, um, at the White House or something, right? We literally made a list of all the people we knew across all of the movements of demographics that mattered and that we um, felt were underrepresented in tech and asked them to have their folks apply. Um, and so uh, basically we were in touch with like I feel like all of the kind of major social justice movement folks in the country. Um, and they, they brought people into tech that had never been there before who are going to be very good colleagues, who are going to be able to advocate for themselves and for each other. Um, and so if we want to solve this, like we should talk to the people who've been doing this for many, many, many years, and we should recruit from them also. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Carla, you want to jump in? And I, I think sure. we want to make sure we get down to everybody. So Absolutely. As as um, so just a few quick things, I think. One, the interview process, um, one of the things that we were really finding when you talk about, um, when we were talking to companies that were like, oh, we want a Stanford, Harvard, MIT student um, at, in our company, that really those things were proxies for a set of skills that had not been articulated yet, right? So you had, uh, you know, it, you know, three projects where you use Java, you had familiarity with data structures, an autodidact who can learn a coding language on their own if the coding language that they're using uh, is not effective for a particular project, right? And then those things were being proxied out to, you know, a set of schools for whom people were familiar with the kind of projects those schools had. So one, get very clear about the skills that you want at the table um, and try to boil them down as much as possible so that you're not using proxies that limit your pool. Um, also, uh, referrals are a big deal because 91% of all white people in the country know 1% of uh, uh, their networks are 1% people of color, right? And 75% of white people in the country don't know any people of color. And that means that when you are doing a recruiting and referral bonus program, the likelihood is that you are going to reproduce um, the exact same dynamics that you have in your company, right? And and it means broadening your ecosystems, right? And and uh, all what that looks like. But I'll go ahead. Cool. Uh, so our team works very closely with Google Ventures, uh, Google's venture fund. One thing it offers is a curriculum across design, security, uh, to all the, por the portfolio companies it invests in. The highest rated class to date is the unconscious bias class. I highly recommend you give it a, a watch. It's on gv.com, and you can find it in the video library, Unconscious Bias, about an hour and a half. And it's a, it's a really, really good class to, uh, to take. Cool. I'll make this uh, pretty quick, but I think the biggest thing uh, and takeaway is to be as inclusive as possible and realize that being inclusive doesn't necessarily mean, like, yes, we have women or, yes, we have people of color. It's also... We have a mother's room. We have family planning that is for some other than uh, the traditional way to have a child. Or we have um, gender neutral bathroom signage. We have training for uh, uncon unconscious bias and training to be better allies, whether it's for people of color, for women, for, um, for queer people. Uh, it's really just being very conscious of the t different types of ways you can be as inclusive as possible and being able to look around a room and say, I am no longer the only one here that is this part of my identity and making sure that nobody feels that way um, and the, that uh, different identities feel comfortable in the places that they work. Well, perfect. I know we're getting kicked out of here, but um, that doesn't mean that this conversation stops here. Um, so continue to have the conversation at Signal and continue to have the conversation when you go back to your respective jobs. I just want to thank Twilio as well and, and, and really uh, the Signal organizers for having this conversation um, at, the, at the conference. So thank you again and thank for the panelists.